What Commissioner Murphy must have known at that time and what ABC News has now learned is that not just heroin and other drugs, but jewelry, money, even weapons, all evidence in criminal cases, is missing from this building, the police department property office. The police official told ABC News that he warned both the past commissioner and the present one of the poor security, but nothing changed. We have also learned that the stealing is not confined to just a handful of policemen, but involves many. The investigation is completed. It should reveal that the New York City Police Department, thought by many to be this country's finest, hasn't even been able to guard its own front door. Lem Tucker, ABC News, New York. There's more people here than there's at Shea Stadium, I think. I don't know how all this came about, but uh, the phones have been ringing for the last 24 hours, and I uh, just avoided everybody. I didn't know what the heck they, I was going to talk about, and I talked to my superiors here at Paramount, and they said, well, we can't favor anybody, so we'll let everybody be here at one time. As uh, the police commissioner announced yesterday, some 24 hours ago, I guess, a disaster has happened to the city of New York. He's quite disturbed about it. I'm quite disturbed about it. I worked hard on a case back in 1962, as my partners did, my, both my partners. Uh, when I say partners, I mean the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, and I mean the New York City Police Department and their superior. That amount of narcotic to be taken out of the police property court's office. Well, my recollection of it, it goes back to 1962. In the early part of 1962, in January, uh, 20, January 17th, my partners and myself, the entire group of some 300 men who was involved, seized uh, 22 pounds of heroin, I believe it was, in, uh, in Brooklyn, concealed in the, uh, in the ceiling, along with machine guns and machetes and revolvers and uh, with that, these, these weapons were used in other crimes at the time. And uh, we arrested one, at that time, Pasquale Fuca. And uh, tracing back for the four months that we worked on that case, we discovered that, Pas we, we knew that Pasquale Fuca was inventory on February of 1962. What the commissioner must be referring to as the theft or whatever, the missing property from the property clerk's office, must be pertaining to the narcotics that was found in the steamer trunk up in the, uh, up in the Bronx. The because ADU. whatever it was, the difference of, there was a total of 112 pounds, as I recall, uh, involved in it with the 22 pounds in Brooklyn. Now to transport that there, uh, it took us, you know, it took almost the entire manpower out of disposal. Uh, I remember our commanding officer at that time insisted that armed guards would transport this any time it had to go in and out of court. Uh, it was taken down there on a dolly, if I remember, because it was a steamer trunk and some three suitcases involved, and it was, if I can describe it, it's all uh, depicted in the book in the French Connection. There's a page in there, which incidentally, it comes to my attention. Uh, the book was released April 29, 1969. Uh, there's a picture in the book, in the hardcover of the book, of the entire seizure of the narcotics that was, took place in the Bronx. There's a reason why all this, this narcotics was shaped in either footballs or uh, Italian breads uh, with... I, I can only answer one at a time. What would you be telling him? Well, I'm mean, very willing to uh, cooperate in any way with the, uh, the police department or the Federal Bureau, and, and I'm very incensed upon it, and I'm more than willing to cooperate as to my knowledge of it. I have not seen the narcotics since 1962. I have never had an occasion to either put it into the property clerk's office or take it out of the property clerk's office. Hey, 23 pounds. The Brooklyn, the Brooklyn 
heroin has been lifted as well. It was just announced on the headquarters. Twenty three more. No, I, I, I'm not aware of that. There was twenty. There was twenty two or twenty three pounds. Twenty three pounds it was. That was out of Brooklyn. That was in glass scene. Those were in glass scene packages. Plain. Plain. That's missing now. Yes. Do you know anything about that at all? No, I. That's the first I heard of this. Now that now this is missing. You described. You described the way you You described the way you took the narcotics to court with an armed guard to protect the narcotics. You described it as being in a steamer trunk carried on a dolly. Nevertheless, the commissioner said yesterday that that material at one time was sent to Washington and returned by Railway Express. How does that strike you? Well, uh, as I got from the commissioner, uh, I didn't get from the commissioner, but from reading his report, that it was sent down there for a display before Congress, and it was shipped back down by Railway Express. There's only one man, in my knowledge and my familiarity with the police department, there's only one man that can sign out the narcotics, the person who signs it in. And if he takes out, uh, there's a voucher listing all of the contraband seen, whether it be weapons, narcotics, money, and what have you. It all goes on the voucher. If you take it out, you'd have to take out the entire seizure, including the machine guns, the machetes, and what have you, that was seized. Now, we, I know how we took it to court. How it got sent back here by Railway Express, uh, I just, well, I couldn't believe it when I read it. Mr. I just Reagan, Mr. Reagan, uh, the last time you saw that, that narcotics loot, when was it, 62? 1962, uh, yes, around uh, February of 1962. When did you last see it, at the property clerk's office? No, the, the first, uh, first time I saw it and the last time I saw it, uh, it was in Brooklyn on the first seizure, which was in January. It was taken, there was a patrolman assigned to it to guard it and take it and deliver it to the laboratory for analysis. That same patrolman, to show the continuity of evidence, had to take it and bring it to the property clerk's office. Then I saw it in court. Then there was a second seizure, the one in the Bronx. The last time I saw that was on February 25th, 1962, at which time it was transported to the property clerk's office and had never had to be removed because of the fact that the the perpetrator in that case well, uh, caught the plate. Which of the two is the... the last place you saw the Bronx shipment? The last place you in the Bronx. In the Bronx. Where was it? I did not sign it in or out of the property yeah, clerk's office at any time. Uh, I forget the address, but it was in Bryan Avenue. 11 Which? responsible for the voucher. Only one officer who... Tell one one thing. Which no, I did not. Which I did not sign for it any, at any time. Eddie, if those two seizures no, two. is the one that we're talking about in the French Connection, then. Well, from what a uh, confidence in the police department that through their methods of investigation, they're going to come up with the individual that did this or individuals. Uh, it's only a theory as being uh, in law enforcement for so many years that the entire seizure of narcotics, uh, to come to the desk, if you know the physical attributes of the property clerks, and you have the big superiors down there, well, uh, the, investigation, the investigation is continuing, and uh, I'd rather not say anything at this time that may hamper the investigation. I would be, uh, if anything is available to me, through my attorney's office, I left an open line to any contacts I may have that would like to see this recovered. I, vote, I left an open line through my attorney's office. We will forward that on to the authorities, and hopefully we can get that back. Do you agree that this is an inside job? So? Most police officials say this is an inside job. Do you agree with that? I cannot uh, agree with it now. I don't think it's an outside job. You have to go inside, but not saying that somebody is inside. I might have my own theories about it, and I will illustrate this. There was members in the underworld sometime in 1969, and I've said this before, but members of the underworld in 1969 made an endeavor through, I'll just say, a law enforcement official to find out the voucher number of the property that was, that was seized in the French Connection. And he stated that he needed the voucher number so that he could find himself an apartment in the city of New York, that the superintendent would not give him an apartment because he did not have the uh, marriage certificate that he needed to, to show that he was married. I laughed at it, so did the official at that time. But it's not beyond anyone's imagination that organized crime, knowing that there's $32 million worth of heroin sitting in a, in a building, it's not a, beyond imagination when they're hijacking planes all over this world and sticking up very uh, highly secured places that they would not go in and stick up this very uh, establishment or... or in this case, Eddie, it probably if you, cannot, if you cannot, Eddie, get the police commissioner himself broke the news yesterday.
in a mastery of understatement. In September of 1969, a property clerk receipt indicates that a detective removed the narcotics for a district attorney. At this time, the signature of the detective is suspected to be false, and the shield number given on the receipt has never been issued to any member of the service. It is tragically apparent that the department's procedures for the control of confiscated narcotics have been totally inadequate. The capture of most of that heroin was dramatized in the 1971 movie, The French Connection. The cop who supposedly broke that case, which involved the cleverest of international dope peddlers, is Eddie Egan, who, while apparently not just right for the part of himself in the film, did get a role. Today, Egan called a news conference and talked about the theft. The heroin had been removed from the office of the property clerk. The following day, you were informed that an additional 24 pounds of heroin were unaccounted for. As I stated at that time, a full-scale investigation was launched immediately. This investigation has now been underway for a number of days and has disclosed that the problem is well beyond the scope of my original announcement. As a result, I have ordered today a full-scale inventory of all narcotic seizures by the property clerk. At 8 a.m. Thursday, December 21st, a team of 200 specially selected uniformed police officers and detectives will begin an exhaustive accounting of the six offices at which narcotics contraband is stored. This effort will continue around the clock until the inventory is complete. The nature of this investigation demands that no further public disclosures be made at this time until the full dimensions of this problem are known and our investigation has been completed I will have nothing further to say. I regret the necessity for not providing more specific information at this time. However, I am able to advise you that Mr. Najari has entered this investigation with our full cooperation and support. ...to speculate concerning the facts in this case. I feel very strongly that it would not be in the public interest to escalate the level of speculation. I appreciate the fact that my inability to deal with questions contributes to such speculation. However, I am convinced that it is in the best interest of all concerned to not accept any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Eddie Egan says he's using his contacts to try to find out just what happened. And the Red Face Police Department is certainly trying to find out just what happened. Maybe if they find it all again, they'll make another movie. Lem Tucker, ABC News, New York.